Master Corwin, it is a delight and a joy to have you here from so far away. I somehow think that for this particular session, I would be um, a poor friend and servant had I not come. I'll give folks a couple more minutes to arrive, should they wish, and then I will open the floor up for stories. Um, tonight's talk topic, if you did not see the post, is remembrances of those that we've lost, um, quite specifically uh, His Grace Duke Jonathan, the first King of Ansteora, who passed this weekend. Um, but if you're so moved to speak of anyone else we've lost, this is also an appropriate time for that too. Okay. It's about 10 minutes after the hour. Um, I'd like to go ahead and open up the floor to anyone who has a story that they'd like to share or a remembrance. Um, I myself did not know His Grace very well. Um, I only bumped into him just a couple of times and he was such an imposing figure that I did not dare approach. Um, <laughs> though I did manage to snap a photo of him that's being shared quite a bit today uh, at the Namron Medfair where he's wearing a chainmail coif and um, is looking just very Arthurian um, <laughs> and, and that that noble mean is part of why I didn't ever dare approach him um, but uh, to those who know him well I would invite you to share whatever stories about his grace that you would be willing to to share with us I am actually sitting here trying to remember if Master Robin has known John longer than I have, or if I've known him longer than Robin did. Um, I first met Duke, uh, Count Sir Jonathan <laughs> when he was Prince of Ansteor in the Kingdom of, uh, Crown Prince of Ansteor in the Kingdom. A month after I first met him, you were his Royal Herald, so I have to assume you knew him before I did. Well, frighteningly, I actually knew him when he was just Squire Jonathan de Lovison. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I met, uh, I met him as near as I can figure it out about two months before he got knighted and about eight months before he won his first crown tournament. Um, uh, he, um, he and Willow came up to Namron for our first tournament. Not sure, but it may have been the first tournament he fought in as a knight. Um, and he won. And that was sort of the beginning of the long relationship that uh, Jonathan and Willow had with the Baron, well, with the Shire of Nemo. <laughs> Very long time ago. Um, they moved there um, primarily so that they could continue education. Um, they moved in uh, to this little apartment. <laughs> And the, the Shire very rapidly sort of adjusted itself to uh, treat their uh, their home as part of the uh, part of the infrastructure, I guess. You know, closest thing we had to a noble in the area. Yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, it was uh, Jonathan was very instrumental in the structure the, that Protector took on after uh, he won it the first time. I mean, our whole plan as a Shire had been to sucker somebody into coming up to teach us to fight. Uh, by having a tournament and then, you know, guilting them into coming up. And he moved, so I guess it worked. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I remember, uh, well, let's see. I remember him winning his first crown tournament because uh, Count Freya and I and um, Ivar Battlescald and Athelstane Oh, and Aurelian and Roshenda and Finn Kelly all journeyed out to the Outlands to watch John fight in his crown tournament. We didn't even really know what we were going to go watch. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were at 6,500 feet in the air, and John was used to fighting in Dallas, which was like zero. <laughs> 500. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> and um, uh, 
I don't think any of us really realized how good John was until that day. Uh, he, um, he was a good instructor. He taught me to fight, um, but he uh, he dispatched his first two round fights without even breaking a sweat. And this is in old Aiden Gold when it was two out of three, single limb crowns. Um, and in the third round, he was paired against uh, his knight. He was paired against Corus Um And you know, a lot of people were like, "Oh, it was Corus. He was your knight. What are you going to do?" And he looked at us all with a really puzzled look on his face, put down his right-handed equipment, picked up his left-handed equipment, and said, Chorus can't fight left-handers. Oh, my. Walked out and just uh, obliterated him. Walked back over, dropped his gear, picked up his right-handed equipment again, and then stopped, put it all down again, disappeared into his tent. Uh, just before he got in night, just before he got knighted, uh, uh, Chorus and his lady Leah had made him a new squire's belt. And it was probably, I don't know, this wide, and it had um, their arms and John's arms on it. And he tied it on over his knight's belt and fought the rest of the day wearing it as a tribute to his knight. That's beautiful. Which, you know, in some ways is probably the best story I have about John. Uh, he was, um, you know, I, I, I tell a lot of stories as you noticed when I was out visiting and uh, a lot of them have him in them in one way or another, but that's the one I always come back to when I'm trying to describe the man. Um, you know, uh, interestingly, he won that tournament against a guy who lived at that altitude, who was in really great shape. It was one of the, uh, uh, oh, what the heck were they called now? And I'm losing my mind. It was Heinrich Jaeger anyway. And um, in the second fight, uh, John just ran out of steam. I mean, dead, just completely ran out of steam. And... Uh, for those of us who knew him, he had this stance that he would take when he was just resting or just trying to watch what was going on in the fight where he would kind of tuck in behind his shield and he would just slump. And I remember watching Heinrich have the realization that he had him cold. He was going to win this crown tournament. And uh, he stepped into range with his guard down and John hit him fast enough that it occurred between the frames of the 16 millimeter film that was taken. Um, and it was interesting going into that final, um, it was an interesting study in culture mm -hmm. because you had all of the traditional Aidenveld people on the far side of the field sitting with their majesties of Aidenveld. And then you had all the rowdies from Monsteora on the other side of the field. And Willow was encouraging people to sing and to dance. Uh, Applestain did a, a knife dance, Scottish knife dance, you know, where he was dancing around a knife stuck in the ground. And we were whooping it up, and, and John was just sitting there very calm, like a rock in a river, uh, sucking up all the energy out of us. I think every single person who was there passed out after he won. Um, but that was his first grand tournament. And then um, they had an interesting reign as King and Queen of Badenville, and that was actually when I started uh, uh, being their herald. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we, we uh, <laughs> the end of their reign, we drove from uh, Wiesenfeuer to Alberon nonstop, starting at five o'clock in the evening. Ouch. We got, we got there, we all passed out for about four hours. And uh, then we got up and went to the coronation. And uh, his grace and his grace and her grace, uh, you know, did their bit of the ceremony, and then they disappeared out of the hall and came back in their alternate personas, uh, ruffian Irish, as I remember. Um, but that was uh, one of the gifts that he got for stepping down was a, was a flat cap with a county coronet embroidered on the inside of the brim, or on, not on the inside, on, on the flat part of the brim. So he turned it up, it was a county coronet, otherwise it was just a hat. Um, he was very pleased with that. And that was the event where uh, uh, Theo Mitran would told him that he should go back to on store and make us ready to become a king. Uh, which is how they came to have a very short break between being king, queen of Aidenveld and king and queen of on store, first king and queen of on store. How many months or what span of time was that? I don't About three months, I think, maybe Ouch. four. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I was actually really surprised that they fought, but 
John and Willow felt pretty strongly that they were um, that they had a pretty solid understanding of what needed to happen to help the kingdom become itself, become kingdom. We were really, I mean, speaking now with hindsight, we were not ready. <laughs> we had three princes. But um, yeah, that was that was John winning crown. And he beat Olaf Arm Crusher in the finals of the first crown tournament. In a rice farm outside of Brindle. Excuse me for interrupting. Sure. Jonathan stepped down as count on March 3rd. Yeah. Uh, of 79. He won crown tournament on May 10th, two months and a week later, and became king again one month after that on June 16th. And Willow became queen again one month after that in July 14th. Yeah, we had some problems scheduling the, uh, the coronation around everybody's schedules, and Willow couldn't be there for that. I remember. I, I set up a uh, trivia quiz once uh, uh, for the 10th anniversary, and one of the questions was, who was crowned queen at Onsteroy's second coronation? And the joy of it was it was our first queen. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, <clears throat> Interesting historical fact, the premier chevalier of Onciora was invested at that at Jonathan's coronation. Extra points if you can tell me who it was without looking it up. John the Plain of Sean. That's right. Sir, sir, well, Lord, Lord, Lord John. is usually considered the premier chevalier because he was the first on Steaua knighted back in 75. Yes, but the chivalry met at that coronation and decided that John would, was going to be designated as premier chevalier. It was quite an interesting little conversation. It's amazing what you learn when you're being a voice hero. <laughs> All right. Willow took the Aitenvelt custom of choosing as Queen's champion the first knight elevated in her reign, yeah. which was the second knight elevated in Ansteor because her reign started one month later. That was William of Weir. That's right. <laughs> I think I didn't remember that, Robin. Well, I have a little more focus, A, on our precedence, and B, on Queen's Champion than you do. Uh, well, yes, probably that's true. <laughs> Although I, I do remember, uh, I remember uh, uh, Tyvar's elevation to the Pelican. Um, that was in February, I think the 28th. Yep. which would make it two weeks before he became a white scot. Mm -hmm. uh, that's white about right. Yeah. So anyway, that was a long time ago, but we're talking <laughs> about Jonathan here. Somebody else dived in here and saved me, but otherwise I'll just talk. We are talking about anybody that you wish to uh, remember. So mm -hmm. if you would like to talk about Tyvar's elevation to the Order of the Pelican, that is a story we would love to hear. And we have two hours. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I don't really. I mean, I just remember him being invested. It really wasn't something that was re relevant. You know, interesting side fact. When I met Willow, she was a wall. Because we only had two peerages. Well, depending on how you look at it, I guess. But we had the chivalry and we had everybody else. Can I, and, uh, I asked Willow one time what she got her laurel for. And she said, I don't know. I don't really have an art. So I just sponsor arts competitions. Well, she didn't get it for arts. The Lowell wasn't an arts peerage when she got it. That's true. The well, Lowell was the non-fighting peerage when she got it. That's why when yeah. they first let Crown start making pelicans, she became on Sarah's first pelican by switching from the Lowell to the pelican. Yes, because the Crown of Aidenveld called her up and said, hi, you're going to resign your Laurel. We're going to make you a pelican. <laughs> um. I have never heard that before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, a little background on the orders. Sure. Knighthood was started in the party that had no intention of ever having a second day. That was the start of the SCA. They knighted a guy just because he was the only guy who entered the tournament, and didn't call himself a knight. I love the fact that knighthood is founded in humility. Mm -hmm. As it should be. Two years later at 12th night, um, they realized they were going to keep doing this and they needed more structure. 
So they established the order of the laurel for all the non-fighters. Mm -hmm. And at first, when you became a laurel, you would get a unique title. The first two were master artificer and master musician. Okay. They had one problem because their best fighter, the guy who founded the steps, by the way, um, wouldn't accept knighthood because he would not swear fealty to any earthly lo uh, lord because of his religious convictions, or at least that's the way he expressed it. Yeah, he well, said that numerous times. I suspect it's true, although he never did finish seminary. Lloyd never believed him. <laughs> um, yeah, well, oh, yeah. another short redheaded guy. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> In any event, so they established master of arms for someone who was a knight who would, basically who wouldn't swear fealty. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and which is why you see Corwin wearing a baldric. Um, or as Duke Frederick of Holland says, does not play well with others. Yes. Um, um, okay. But the Pelican Let me ask was you a founded question, originally Robin. so that the board of directors could make peers. Yeah. Because people who were working on the board level, specifically the lower king of arms, wasn't being recognized. Eventually, they decided that was not a good idea and opened it up to crowns making it. At that point, Willow became our first Lowell by switching, became, became our first Pelican by switching from the Lowell to the Pelican. So the first two masters at arms, because, you know, it's random history, were uh, Duke Richard the Short or Richard Montroyal. Um, and uh, Edwin Broussard, mm -hmm. who almost immediately after being elevated to Masters Baldrick moved to the East Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, a long time ago. <laughs> I have heard uh, that there are kingdoms that simply, while Masters may move into that kingdom, they do not make Masters because they have a problem with I, the very idea is that i don't know if it's still true but it was certainly true in modiers for many many years including when jonathan moved in okay um mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact when john and willow moved to modiers the crown tried to make willow swear fealty because all peers are in fealty and jonathan stood up right next to her and said see this baldrick no she does not have to swear fealty no all peers are not in fealty Kapoor says knights have to swear fealty. And it uh, it annoyed uh, some people in, in Moutier's. The thing about John and Willow is that they were capable of annoying people for the right reasons in the right way. And they were capable of annoying people for the wrong reasons in the wrong way. And, you know, they were larger than life in both directions. That's true. Although John John tended to um, only offend people on principle. <laughs> That's um, true. You know, to, to answer the question, um, I'm aware of about four kingdoms that really have issues with making masters. Mm -hmm. I, I've lived in a couple of them. Mm -hmm. um, I have made my views known pretty strongly to the uh, assembled chivalries of those kingdoms that if I ever find out they turn somebody down on that grounds, I'm going to come down and stop. <clears throat> I'm sorry, put my boot in some people's butt. Um, uh, interestingly, um, when you press them, they can't give you answers. They just say, well, we don't understand it. You know, <laughs> which I suspect is the alternate motto for the MSCA. We don't understand. Um, Believe me, Cole, when I sympathize. <laughs> well, I've been wearing a baldric for a really long time now. 82 or three? Three, yeah, after my pelican. Yeah. And um, uh, I've, I've lived in a lot of places, so it's been an interesting experience. I, I think we had a brief conversation at 40 Year about uh, the uh, joys of inner kingdom anthropology. Yes. Um, Hmm. What was the story I was going to tell? I had a John story that you. While you're oh. thinking of it, I will tell the story of the first time I fought John. Oh, sure. Now, I had. I was a fencer. I would talked about maybe doing some heavy fighting, but I'd never gotten so far as to get to a fighter practice. 
when uh, the morning of Steps Warlord in 79, and the Steps Marshal, who was also the Steps Vicar, who was Lloyd Von Acre, uh, came up to me and said, okay, Robin, you've been talking about wanting to fight. Do you want to enter the tournament? Actually, he said, do you want to fight the buys? Um, and I said, sure, why not? But not the buys. If I'm going to fight, I'll enter. Uh, authorization? No, there was nothing called authorization yet. Um, so who am I fighting? His Royal Highness, Councilor Jonathan de la <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't there's seem There's only quite one fair. man... <laughs> There's only one man in Ansteroa who has ever won Crown Tournament, and he's done it twice. By contrast, I'm about to have a piece of a tan in my hand for the first time. Oh, dear. They put me in Lloyd's armor, That's put right. William of Weir Shield, Squire William of Weir Shield on my arm, Lady Joycelyn's sword in my hand. I got two minutes of shield training, which was <laughs> William throwing blows while I did this. Oh, dear. Walked on the field, still never having thrown a blow with a piece of rattan. Now I could describe the fight, but you know what's the point? He let me. Th he was very polite. He let me throw some blows. Then he threw one, and I screamed, and I went down to my knees, screamed because we didn't have leg armor yet. Oh, ow! Yeah. I mean, armor was very basic then. We, we were just now starting to enforce the idea of gorgets. Mm -hmm. But he mm -hmm. hit my leg where I had, was wearing a pair of tights and nothing else with a Jonathan shot. Mm. Mm. And I screamed and I dropped down. And he tossed his um, shield, which was only a buck. They only took a buckle against me. And he let me throw some blows, and then he threw one, and then I fell down, and then I got up, and I limped off the field, and I'm taking off the armor, and worst of all, it's double a limb. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do this crap again, and as God is my witness, I had no reason to. I was sitting there thinking, you know, this is a hot day, I have an air-conditioned home, what am I doing this stupid thing for? Why am I wearing these stupid clothes? Why don't I just leave? And it's quite possible that I would have. But just then someone came up to me and said, excuse me, Her Royal Highness wants to speak to you. Her Royal Highness does not know me from Adam's off ox. The only two things she could possibly know about me are one, I just tried to kill her Lord and two, I was appallingly bad at it. <laughs> I have no idea what I did wrong. I'm pretty sure I didn't do anything right. And so I wandered up there and I bowed, exhausting my entire store of protocol. And she had to be reminded who I was because as I said, she did not know me from Adams off Ox. Oh, yes, you're the Lord who just fought my, my husband. I want you to know that I know that he can earn glory only because there are those with the courage to face him. And I thank you for that. And she said, but I saw as they did the salutes that you had no lady to salute. Would you take this my favor? and wear it for the remainder of the day. All six of her ladies in waiting added theirs. I have never gotten through this story with dry eyes. I proudly walk on the field with seven favors on my belt. Now, much later, I finally started getting pretty good at Rotan weapons. I, I became a centurion. I've won some tourneys. I've, I've got had my share of victories. But I'm not sure I have ever had a victory to match that defeat. Jay Rudine went to that event. Robin of Gilwell came home. Mm -hmm.
No I, 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 I have to apologize for laughing when you talked about the leg shot. So <laughs> no, it's intended to be funny. So when I when I uh, when I started learning to fight from Jonathan, nobody told me that he was blind. Um, when he had his helmet on, he literally couldn't see anything past the end of his hand. And uh, the way he compensated for that was his first shot was always a leg shot. And then as soon as he knew where your shield was, the next shot was for your head. And um, the first six months that I fought, I had a bruise the size of my hand mm -hmm. on my thigh from trying to stop him from hitting me in the leg. Yeah. Six months, I didn't stop him. It was painful. <laughs> But yeah, he was, um, it's funny, I suppose. Uh, a lot of things that I did in the early days of Onstiora were directly related to my service with the crown of Onstiora, but specifically with John and Willow. Um, uh, I had a small part in writing the laws. I had a small part in writing the ceremonies, which His Grace Lloyd unfortunately made worse later on. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I served them because they were they were the example of courtesy and honor and chivalry that I believed in. I believed in. And, um, you know, he's one of two people I would have considered giving my field to over a very long time. Um, Frey and I did a lot of reminiscing in 40 years over uh, our <laughs> shared experiences. Um, you know, Frey always had the advantage that he could write songs. I just had to, to speak in court. So speaking of writing songs, he was definitely known for his skill at combat arms, but he was also one of our premier bards. Can either of you speak to that? Because we have our kingdom bard present, and I think that he might particularly enjoy hearing some bit of lore about our first king also being later on being a premier bard. Well, I absolutely would appreciate exists. that. Premier Bard exists because Willow decided College of Bards was going to exist. Mm -hmm. She decided to establish the Queen's College of Bards, and she set out what it ought to be. And what she did was she went to every little local group and held a Bardic competition and proclaimed a Bard of that group for the college. Mm -hmm. um, there was an event. It was actually at Camp Burnett mm -hmm. at which... The I think it was I won't, I'm I'm confusing too. Never mind. I don't remember where it was. Where they were going to make the first premier bard of Onstera for the college. Now this is something the crown didn't really care about, or know about, or say anything in. This was Willow's college, and um, for years the crown almost but not quite ignored it in the sense that. You'd come up to the Royal Herald and you'd say, OK, we had our, our I said, Fred, and here's the winner. Please call up this person in court to call up the winner and give out the prize. And that was it. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan was the first premier bard of Onstera. Now, remember, this belongs to the college. Um, that lasted for eight or nine years. I became a premier bard of Onstera for the college. By this time, it was getting to be a big thing, and a lot of people were caring about it. But it existed because Willow decided it would and made it happen because um, Willow does things. <laughs> um, well, I would say it slightly differently, Minister. Um, Her Grace has an amazing capability of identifying something that looks like it would be fun pouring herself into it like with the abandon of youth, getting it going, and then finding someone for whom it is a passion and handing it to them. 
Yeah. She did that repeatedly in the early days. Um, mm -hmm. It is it is one of the things that I uh, treasure uh, of those memories from when I was a stripling. <laughs> That's uh, not in the early 80s. In the early 90s, the college was ended and the crown and the, the kingdom started having the premier bard competition. So I have won it once for the college and twice for the kingdom. Awesome. But it's the same thing. And it's that if Willow decides something's going to happen, it's going to take a lot of work to stop her. Um, and Jonathan was the first one. Yeah, I'd forgotten that. Um, he was an interesting guy. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know how he became Chorus's squire. Uh, Chorus wandered in one day and found him hustling chess. Okay. He was a speed chess uh, hustler. And um, uh, I made the mistake of playing him once. And it's embarrassing to get trashed by a guy who doesn't appear to be even looking at the board. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, he's the only man I ever saw kill somebody in a tournament by tripping. True story, we're at Camp Burnett. I don't remember what the event was. And <clears throat> but Willow had made him this really beautiful fighting outfit, very Byzantine, flowing skirt, stole enchilada. And um, in the middle of one of his fights, he tripped and his hand flew out and hit his opponent square between the eyes as he fell. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure his Grace Inman probably has some stories in that vein as well. I've been, I've been hit by him a million times. <laughs> uh, I, can't, uh, I can't think of one that was hit any worse than the other. I thought he was amazing. Uh, he wasn't particularly physically gifted, but uh, he knew how to make the most out of what he had. And he was, in combat, he was tactically brilliant. He knew where, where to go, what to do, and how to get you open for something that you never saw coming. Yes. I admired him more than I can tell you. Jonathan told me something about fighting that went a whole lot further than the question I was asking. It was middle eighties and I was starting to fight a little and I asked him, I'd seen someone spin. I said, okay, what do you do if someone spins on you? He said, kill him. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you do if he's holding his shield up and he spins and he said, kill him. And I said, but what if he said, kill him? <laughs> and there was a lot of wisdom about the focus of a fighter there. What do you do if kill him? Yeah. yeah, he kept it pretty simple. Well, it was funny. I was one of his. I was one of his. Uh, his and Lloyd's uh, um, practice dummies. No, um, <laughs> walking. I don't, know, I don't know what the word was, but uh, I got a lot of the same advice. What do I do if they do this? Hit them. Well, but how? Just just hit them. But, you know, it's funny. It's like um, we were at Camp Burnett. There were a lot of early events at Camp Burnett. Oh, yeah. And um, I remember, uh, oh, Lord. I don't remember why, but I was walking through camp and Willow grabbed me and said, I've got eight people over here that want to learn about fighting. Go teach them the introduction. And I was like, uh, 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 Willow, I, I, I really don't. I'm not sure I'm the guy. And she said, Oh no, you'll be fine. And she shoot, you know, handed me a sword and a shield and said, go teach these guys how to fight. <laughs> and I wound up doing 45 minutes of introduction to fighting that I didn't even know I had in my head. And it was all just quoting John really more than anything else. You know, it's interesting. I think back now and I try to remember, but I'm pretty sure that Jonathan Loveson was the first person to ever win a crown tournament with a mace. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true. There's a guy out here in the West named uh, Rolf the Relentless who's been king about five times, but he and he's done it with a mace, but I think he did it after John did. First person to do what? Win a crown tournament with them using a mace mm. as their primary sword. 
Can any of you tell me anything that you remember of note about their reigns and ways that they changed on Steora? Holy cow. All right. <laughs> well, let me see. <laughs> I figured um, that would give you some fodder. Reign? Um, I'm going to give the sociological explanation and then let Corwin tell you specifics. The Anseoan area was part of Aitenvelt when Aitenvelt went from Idaho to Florida. And Aitenvelt was also the barony in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. crown of Aitenvelt went all over Aitenvelt. They went up to Northern Phoenix, they went down to Southern Phoenix, they went over to Eastern Phoenix, they went out to Western Phoenix. We were founded on the rumor mill. Mm -hmm. And our structures were <laughs> all built around households because that's the only structure you're allowed to build without getting permission from some shadowy guy 2,000 miles to the west. Um, in 70, late 77, late 77, we became a principality and we actually had a prince, but a prince is nothing like a king. A prince can do all kinds of things when the king says yes. It's a little better than not having one, but it is not the same as having a king. Now, what would happen every year or so, a crown would come and visit and tell us how we had to do things, which wasn't the way we'd invented because we'd invented everything ourselves stupidly. Um, and they wanted us to use their stupid method instead of our stupid method. And they upset people and they go away and we would have to sweep up the pieces and try to fix things. And we eventually had this idea, hey, we don't have to let this guy from 2000 uh, miles away in. We can become our own kingdom and he can't screw us up. And everyone jumps on the bandwagon and it does a big, we're gonna do become the kingdom. And they, they announced it on uh, the Tournament of Chivalry in March 10th. And everyone, I mean, it is the only time on Steyr has been together. <laughs> Households that hate each other, we're working together to become a kingdom. And we all have this, we're gonna be our own kingdom. Wah, wah, wah. By the way, I am describing the birth of Chimeris just as much as the birth of on Steyr because I was there when they were in kingdom. And everything I say applies equally to both. And everyone is excited and happy and looking forward to it until the end of Crown Tournament. And then suddenly we realize, wait a minute. This doesn't mean we don't have to let the king in. It means he never goes away. And half the kingdom is happy with this because the guy they wanted won. And the other half of the kingdom is horrified by this because the guy they didn't want won. <laughs> and you know it if you thought it through you knew that was going to happen but it doesn't become real until it's a person mm -hmm. now they became king and queen and tried to do the best job they could the problem is this everything has changed and no one knows it because everyone knows how much authority they have, how much influence they have, how much power they have, what they can and can't do. You may not like it, but you know your position. Okay, suddenly we put a player on the board with far more power than any other player has ever had. Now, power is constant. Every decision can only be made once. If they have more power, then you have less. The barons have less because the crown is there to watch them and tell them what they can or can't do. The peers have less because the crown knows the people they're talking about. The uh, households have less because we're going to do more official stuff and less unofficial stuff. The officers have less because the crown is right there to remove them if you don't do what they like. Everyone knows they've lost power and influence. They've lost their position and they all know whose fault it is. They haven't processed that this had to happen, that this was automatic with becoming a kingdom. What they know is they've lost what they had last month and it's their fault. Uh, I didn't figure this out until years later when I saw the same thing happening the same way in Trimeris. But Anstea almost ripped itself apart in John and Willow's post reign. 
And I don't think anyone was trying to be evil. I think everyone knew they had a legitimate grievance against the other side. I mean, these are households that hated each other for, for years anyway. And all it did was take all of our, all of the annoyances, move them up to a higher plane where other people were gonna notice and eventually the board of directors stepped in. And there was a court of inquiry which left such a bad taste in everybody's mind that the great lesson on stay or learned was this. I don't have to like you. I have to work with you. And if I don't, those idiots out in California are gonna come here and be even worse than you. Now, that's my attempt to describe it from a, I'm not taking any sides position. Cole, when you're here and you were on a side. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always articulated it as a conflict between parliamentarians and royals. Mm -hmm. um, In a the land northern that had part been ruled of by parliament up till then. Well, it had been pretty loosey goosey. I mean, you know, it's like whoever called the king last won. Um, and all of a sudden, the king lived in in Amran, you know, which was like a real radical shift in the power structure. And you know, to their credit, John and Willow understood that there were going to be some problems. I don't think that they foresaw them being as significant as they were. But I will tell you that after the board intervened in Onstor, I, I took a knee in front of Jonathan. I promised him I would undo every single thing that they did to him before the breath left my body. And by God, I did. <laughs> um, it, was, um, it was a strange time. The culture of Onstor was... It had not been settled yet. The princes had not been able to create a structure that sociologically worked for the kingdom. Um, one of the reasons that the laws of Montsor, and I will cop to the fact that I haven't read them in a few years, used to contain a very explicit law that said nothing, no complaint goes out of kingdom until you've gone through the grievance procedure and through the crown. Um, and I wrote that section of the law. I'm also responsible for the best phrase in the entire set of laws of the kingdom of Montsura, at the pleasure of the crown. <laughs> um, when Inman was king, the first time I think, we had to rebuild the laws. And I made sure that that phrase got inserted every place that we could possibly think of to do it. But uh, John now, Willow, why how did you do that? Why did I do that? <laughs> yes. Why, Your Grace, I believe it was because I was <laughs> friends with the king at the time, and I was probably one of the three most hardcore royalists in the kingdom behind Lloyd. <laughs> um, um, let, me, let me see if I can talk about it a little bit differently, because I don't want to, I mean, there's a lot of old political history that's really probably only vaguely relevant at this point. John and Willow... Uh, did several things. They reached out to all of the chivalry of the kingdom and said, there are things that we have seen in Aitenbelt that we don't think are good for the kingdom. Um, the, the matter of fealty. Uh, old Aitenbelt used to have a thing where you only had to show up in front of the king once, he, once every three reigns and swear your oath. And this caused <laughs> some problems in old Aitenbelt. So John sat down with the chivalry and said, we're not going to do that. And the chivalry of Onsiora agreed at that time that upon your elevation to the order of chivalry, you gave your oath to the crown and that oath was binding until you were released or you died. That was a change. <clears throat> um, it manifested itself a few years later or a while later when Lloyd had me rewrite the coronation ceremony to put the gap in. The gap between crowns is intentionally there so the knights will remember that without their king, they have nothing. Now, I should say now between, they have their, without their crown, they have nothing. Um, John and Willow drafted the first set of laws for the king of Montsur that were based in large part on the principality laws, but Freya and I and a few other people put a lot of time and effort in there to make the law is something that would be strong for the people of Ansura. We 
put in a phrase that gave the peers the right to petition in front of the crown for people's, on behalf of people who didn't feel that they had a voice. And we obligated them to that. And that was John and Willow. Uh, we, they created some of the basic awards, the Star of Merit, um, the Iris. I mean, you know, they did all the groundwork. They did a lot of the scut work that nobody probably even thinks about it this long, you know, this long past that was necessary because we didn't have it in the principality. The principality didn't have an award structure that made sense. It didn't have uh, <laughs> laws that actually covered all of the situations because we had eight mil law. We didn't need to change it. Um, I was thinking about a Willow story. Uh, it was a steps warlord probably... I don't want to. I don't want to date it because then I'll be old. Um, but Willow was queen, so it was during their first reign. Or first reign as king and queen monster. And it was raining as it used to do at Steps Warlord about one and two. And so we'd all gone up the hill to this stone building that existed up at the top of the hill in Camp at Camp Burnett. And we're all just lying there trying to dry out. And uh, Willow's queen, and she's sitting in state. And she says, you know what? Members of the chivalry are supposed to be able to entertain in a civilized court. So she reaches out and she grabs one of the peers by the scruff of the neck and says, you, Sir Knight, I don't even remember who it was at this point, entertain us. Um, and that was the start of the, the queen's decision to be able to be entertained by her peers. Um, she also made the mistake of tapping Lloyd once. He told a six minute, uh, maybe longer, shaggy dog story. Um, yeah, <laughs> what else did they do? Um, well, they created a lot of tension. I mean, there were a lot of people who were very, very unhappy about him. Um, and ultimately all of that ulti led to Lloyd becoming the second king monster. Um, and, you know, he served out the remainder of Willow and Jonathan's uh, uh, tenure as king and queen, and then he served out his own reign. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that, that may be the greatest, that may be the greatest thing that they did. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. Well, they, they, I, I, I don't remember for sure. Jan, maybe you remember. The, the, do you remember if they, if they made the Raven an official part of the Onstorn army? No, I don't. But that mattered a whole lot further, more further north than it did where I was. Yeah, it was just, well, that was all out of Nammer. Uh, but... Uh, there was one thing they did in their last reign, their third reign, that... Yeah. Um, I think worked really well. Willow carried a spear of honor with her everywhere. And whenever somebody did something that impressed her, she'd call that person up and she would take a ribbon and tie it to the spear and say, you have added a ribbon of honor to this spear. And by the, six months later, the thing is absolutely covered with ribbons that are represent the deeds of Onstaorans during her reign. Well, that's beautiful. She continued that actually after she stepped down from that ring. Uh, in actually one of the proudest moments in my entire life came from that spear, and I didn't even know about it. <laughs> uh, I was uh, it was the the crown tournament. I got I got elevated. Well, I got offered knighthood and turned it down. But that's uh, um, and uh, Sir Sir Charles Mapp tied his knight's chain on that spear in, in honor of a fight that I had. Mm. And I totally give Rothgar Farley total credit for that. It wasn't me. It was him. But uh, yeah, she did that. And that's a custom, by the way, that I've exported to a bunch of places as I've traveled. Um, it tends to excite people when you point it out how easy it is to do it. Um, Inman, you've got good stories about John. Well, John and I, I, we weren't close, I guess, as, you know, like friend, friends, we were contemporaries. And mm -hmm. when, when I say that, we, we had this mutual respect for each other. We, uh, 
<clears throat> we used to send our students and squires to each other to be trained. Kelly, it's fostering thing. And uh, <clears throat> what I, I couldn't teach him, John could. And what he couldn't teach his, I, I would. And uh, <clears throat> that relationship endured for years, 20 years. Um, I guess, you know, to say we weren't close as normal friends, we were close as warrior buddies, I guess. But uh, John had one saying that I, I remember very well. He used to say that practice does not make perfect. Only perfect practice makes perfect. And, and that's something that uh, I never really considered. But uh, once I sat and thought about it for a while, I went, yeah, okay. So I, I tailored a lot of my fight practices to that theory. And uh, he and I both agreed that you fight in practice the way you're going to fight in a tournament. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the rumors about our fighter practices being rather brutal quite true uh if you came in and you fought less than full bore you were going to go home with bruises in places you didn't want them but if you and went if you out fought there full blow you were going to come home with bruises in places you didn't want them trust me right. on this one. Oh yeah <laughs> you're gonna but but those bruises are going to have meaning at that point mm -hmm. because something was learned there you know, you weren't just out there slopping around and took an accidental shot to the leg. Somebody actually set you up and gave you one. Well, now, next time won't be that easy to do. But um, his, his love of fighting was just, you know, heroic. Uh, and his study of combat was, too. And uh, like throwing blows that uh, could only be thrown with a, with a live steel. Don't waste your time slapping, you know, throw something that has meaning behind it. And, and that, that also carried over into other aspects of, uh, of the game, the SCA. If you're going to play something, play it hard. Yeah. You know, if, if you want to uh, play persona, play it, you know, study it, learn it, uh, find that character in yourself and go out and, and share that character with others. Um, his sense, his sense of honor, uh, was, you know, unparalleled. Willow and he together were, were kind of this amazing thing. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how else to put it. They were, they were right out of the middle ages when they were together and, uh, they taught people so much uh, without them even knowing it. And that was one of the things that I really appreciated about, about Jonathan and Willow was the fact that they were constantly teaching every day, every event. Something or another was being taught to somebody who needed it. And um, if, if their reigns weren't, you know, spectacular, well, so what? Their whole career was spectacular, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so John was an enabler, um, and I mean that in a positive way. Yeah. Um, when when I, I let's see, yeah, it's been long enough since the Pelican meeting. I can probably talk about this same thing. Um, when we started talking about him as a Pelican, Jonathan, uh, one of the questions was, well, like you know, what's his skill, and um, uh, the order as a whole had a conversation that boiled down to, well, somebody comes up with an idea and he makes it possible for them to do it. Uh, you know, uh, kind of a funny way to talk about somebody, but it really was kind of really what he did and how he looked at things. Yeah, that's a rare skill. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely a rare skill. He, he passed that skill on to me, believe it or not. Um, that's how I managed to get golf war started. Mm -hmm. You know, I was pretty relentless about it, but I had to be diplomatically relentless. <laughs> and I was dealing with two kings that hated each other. And one of the kings, his, 
his kingdom hated him. And it was, uh, it was a very interesting, you know, neg negotiation process that uh, I spent uh, most of the time frustrated by these two idiots uh, who were fighting each other over nothing, little bits and pieces of this and that, that old history. Mm. And, and finally, you know, I, uh, Jonathan, I asked him, I said, John, if you were me, what would you do here? He said, I'd cram them both by the collar and butt their heads together. I said, well, I'll try it. <laughs> so I did. Not literally. I finally just stood up and said, okay, either let's agree or let's just can the whole idea. And whoop, back to the table. We all went and we got it knocked out. But uh, it, was, it was something that, uh, I don't know, that Jonathan had. And he, he taught me another thing. He taught me how to deal with Willow, which was uh, <laughs> ever so much fun, too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I have a story. And, and just kind of building on, you know, the randomness. So um, when Jonathan was, uh, Jonathan Willow were King, Queen of Aidenville, uh, there was a feast in... I want to say border march, but I don't think that's right. Um, where uh, one of the knights threw his chain at the feet of the king. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, that was kind of a provocative gesture, I guess. It was Anvil and the Oscar, Oscar, I believe. And um, the entire uh, the entirety of the knights of Onstura followed the gentleman out of the hall uh, to have a conversation with him about his behavior, uh, and that left Jonathan Delavison and Lloyd von Acre uh, in the hall, and then they presented a brand new gift to the crown, <laughs> um, and it was uh, a sword. Uh, for the crown, and um, uh, it was uh, um, Master Lloyd, <laughs> who interestingly was in fealty to the crown, um, who had to walk around with it because all the knights were busy outside. <laughs> that was a long time ago. We don't do that anymore. Back in the 70s and early 80s, I was playing at heavy fighting. I wasn't taking it serious. Well, no, I was taking it very seriously, but I wasn't interested in learning to fight particularly. Mm -hmm. It was purely political. There were people who wanted to say that fencers are cowards who are afraid to be hit with sticks. Okay, I'll walk out there. You hit me with a stick. We're done with that one. But, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not apologizing for it. It was a necessary step. And I played it at heavy for a while, off and on throughout the 80s. When I became Baron in 88, I felt it was my duty to put on each set of armor at every fighter practice. If you practice every week, you get better. No question about that. And I was getting sort of better. Jonathan was the first one who came up to me and said, you can get good. Would you like to come to my practice and get good? This is before anybody else thought I could get good, including me. And so that meant a great deal to me. Although uh, he put me in a, a, a very uncomfortable position once. I mean, he put me in an uncomfortable position at every fighter practice. That's what fighter practice is. He'd put you in the box, things like that. But one night he said, okay, we're gonna work on fighting from the ground and killing someone on the ground. Robin, get on your knees. Roger, you're attacking Robin. So I'm on my knees looking up at Roger Redhand, who's, you know, one of the corn-fed boys. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do down here. And I, I about decided that what I needed to do was make my way up to the belly, pitch camp, and do the final assault tomorrow. <laughs> but I learned how to fight from the ground. 
the thing I, I will always be grateful to Jonathan for was he believed I could learn to fight before I did. Do you, uh, do you remember uh, a young man that he used to, uh, to train by the name of Gunnar of many names? <laughs> he was this Ooh. tall, slender bean pole fighter that was in no way gifted physically or any other way. But uh, Jonathan always spent more time with Gunnar than he did with any of his other students because he needed more time. He didn't dismiss him as being uh, someone that would be pretty well useless. He couldn't get knighted. He wasn't going to win tournaments. So a lot of knights just kind of push him off to the side and go, well, I won't bother with this one. You know, if he can learn five gooey. Jonathan spent hours and hours and hours with Gunnar. And that, that's the testament to, to the man himself and his, his desire to see everyone that he trains succeed. And uh, I don't find that in, in a lot of, of people teaching. You, you have to want them to succeed and you have to spend your time, give of yourself enough to make sure that they get the best you have. And he did that without even thinking about it. That was just him. Yep. Uh, and that's, you know, he, he may not have seen all that much in you uh robin but he was going to give you his best to make you as good as mm -hmm. you could be and uh oh, i totally agree with that that's uh yeah that's jonathan right down to the ground well, he did it with me <laughs> i started fighting because to be a guy in the sca in those years without fighting was to be a second class citizen <laughs> yep yeah. Yeah, no, well. it wasn't. It wasn't a negative. It was just you don't fight. You're not part of the fighting population. Yeah, yeah it was kind of that way, wasn't it? I, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about that, but you're right. You know, if you didn't oh, yeah. fight, you just, you know, you were looked at like, oh, what's he doing here? You know. Well, it was, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I still remember you showing up though. So I'm an old <laughs> fart. <man. laughs> I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I fought him in a tourney before you did, Corwin. Yeah. I fought Robin my first tournament I ever fought in. was Steps Warlord. First fight of your first tourney. That's right. You were my first SCA tournament fight. Uh, I just remember you showing up to a barony of the Steps populace meeting in Lasgard and I looking at this gorgeous uh, Freon can helmet that you've made going, uh, well, uh, uh, that's really pretty, and um, you can't do it. <laughs> I remember that, you know, but you, but you told me what I could do to make it work. Yeah, well, so, you know, we yeah. wanted you around. We thought you were an okay crew, you know. Yeah, well. <laughs> and we were right. Yeah. I mean, history is yeah, born yeah. now. Yeah, it, it just, it takes a little while sometimes. I got to tell an, un, an Inman story here. Okay. <laughs> Please do. Because, you know, the early day stuff is the stuff that I still remember. So I don't remember what the hell the event was, but they were doing this melee where we had two sides. And when you died, you switched sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of like a 45 minute just continuous meat grinder. Some of us were not quite as, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, into it as we might have been, I guess. So I'd taken a break and I'd walked up to the top of this hill that overlooked where we were doing the fight. And, and I'm sitting there smoking a cigarette and all of a sudden um, his majesty shows up next to me, bums the smoke from me or I bummed one from him. I don't remember. Probably I bummed one from him. Yep. We're standing there smoking our cigarettes and all of a sudden we hear this sound that doesn't sound quite right for a, for a, for a melee. And we look down the hill and uh, Viscount Guthrum Regan of the, uh, of the Wastelands, and I don't remember who the other guy was, were going after each other, Hammer and Tom. And they were not fighting in a chivalric fashion, so we say. They just wanted each other's heads. Oh. 
And his majesty looks at me and sighs, drops his cigarette on the ground, walks down the hill, walks into the fight, not wearing his helmet, I should point this out, reaches out with his hands, grabs their bar grills, and twists both of them to look at him. Says, y'all are going to go sit down now, and let's go. Turns around, walks back up the hill, picks his cigarette up, puts it in his mouth, says, damn, I think I just broke a finger. <laughs> um, which may be a summary of the early Inman raids. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you win, I win. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you may be a master at arms. It's your fault, bro. I know it. I know it. Best thing I ever did. You know, well, all that all that stuff I put you through with that was Jonathan. I know. Or just straighten the whole thing. I thought, well, you know, I'm going to have to tell Corwin I really wanted to just do it. But he's got to talk to John about this one. Well, I will tell you this. <laughs> I hold no animus. But, I, but I'll tell you a funny thing. You know, we... Early on in onshore in history, we were very fortunate. All of our early kings cared. They were trying really hard to be more than more than just a guy sitting in there in a throne, or more than a lady just sitting there in a throne having some guy fight. I, I, I think Jan might agree with me. I think he would. Um, and I think that set a tone for the kingdom for a really long time. Because if you sat that throne and you didn't, you had some royal family who were going to let you know about it. <laughs> and they were not shy. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> So, when you get your job by hitting people with sticks, you do not tend to be shy. <laughs> True. Although, I honestly, I'd be scared of the women who were queen more than I was ever scared of the guys with the swords. <laughs> yeah. You so, know, I, I used to teach a class on, on protocol, and one of the things that I always told people, it's part of my court heraldry series, I always used to say, you know, kings come and go and they forget things because they've been hit in the head a lot. Queens never forget anything. Ever. Yeah. So here's a Jonathan question for you guys. Okay. I saw that he had a sable thistle in cooking. Can any of you remember a meal or feast that he prepared that you got to enjoy? I personally Not cannot. No. Okay. I remember seeing Jonathan when he was on the throne mm -hmm. at an event carrying a tray of food, being a server, going around filling people's plates. The king, of Anste, the, the king of Anstiora, but that's the, what he saw his role uh, to be, was I am a king, right, but I am a servant to my people. And he, he, there was little things like that he used to do, too, that were really impressive. Uh, because he, in, in that role as king, he was always quite humble. They would serve the back of the hall. They would never serve the high, they wouldn't serve the high table. They wouldn't serve the tables immediately adjacent to the high table. No. They would go to the back of the back hall of the and hall, serve yeah. the people who were there for their first event with their, you know, uh, thrift store, furni you know, furnishings, and, and, and they would make them welcome. Absolutely. That's beautiful. That, uh, yeah, it was, and, and uh, he would, uh, this, I used to love to do this too. He would go to uh, the camp, different campsites. He'd walk around in the night, go to different campsites. Uh, wherever somebody had a fire going and there was four or five people sitting around singing or telling stories or just talking, he'd just go and visit each camp, walk around through the whole campsite. And uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that's so rewarding because you get to know a lot of people you don't and uh, they get to know you. It makes being, uh, being a king 
much easier and a whole <laughs> lot more fun for the people. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a Jonathan Penzik story. And I wasn't there. I have this second or third hand. And uh, my guess is Inman may have been there. So if you want to correct me, then forget it. This is my story. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. I will. <laughs> Onstor <laughs> was at Penzik. And in the early days, Onstor did really well at Penzik in large part because our nothing fighters didn't go. It had to be something you were willing to go 2,000 miles to do. So everyone who went for the Onstor Army was solid fighter. And at one point, we were holding an area and switching back and forth who was in the front line simply to avoid getting too tired because we weren't dying fast enough. And at one point, the signals got crossed and everybody for 20 feet fell back. And it takes a few seconds for you to realize the people in front of you have just pulled back. Here is your golden opportunity to roll the lines, just destroy them. Jonathan jumped up and jumped in the middle, and he knew he can't hold it for two seconds. No one can. Hrothgar was 15 or 20 feet away, did the only thing he could think to do. He said, you need to help your grace. And everyone faded back. And Jonathan's title held back the hordes of the East <laughs> That's, for about that 30 seconds until people joined him. No, you're you're right on. That's exactly what happened. And uh, yes, I was there. And <laughs> I was one. I was one of those that fell back. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember uh, the onshore Calentir War that we had um, about an hour out of North Cape. Um, they got rained out, but that's another story. And. Um, as we were assembling the mighty Onstor and Horde, all 24 of us, um, Lloyd was king, so it was the second ring. And I'm looking at Lloyd and I'm like, you know, this is really stupid. They outnumber us like four to one. We're going to get cream. And Lloyd looked at me and he said, yeah, but John and the army are behind us about four hours. You know, um, and uh, I don't remember why, but that just filled me with this amazing sense of comfort that somehow, you know, the fact that we were there didn't matter because, the, you know, John and those guys were going to be behind us. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. I'll tell you a funny Willow story uh, at Finzik, by the way. <laughs> Willow and I and... Uh, one of my squires got separated from, from the bunch. And I mean, separated, like, where are we? We were moving up this trail and down the other side came the two chucks. And uh, they were on the other side and we decided, hey, if we get killed, we can go resurrect and have a drink of water. So we found this, these two trees that were right up against the edge of the trail. And on each side of these, these trees was nothing but briars and thorns and tangled mess. Nobody could get through. So the three of us planted ourselves there. I had a sword and shield and my, uh, my squire had a sword and shield. Willow had a spear. 30 minutes later, Wolf the Mighty comes storming up. He's the leader of the Two Chucks. And he says, make way for the king of the Two Chucks. Willow stabbed him right straight in the face. And down the <laughs> hill he went. <laughs> rolling down the hill. And everybody stopped, you know. Good Lord, what happened? I yelled off down there, hey, Wolf, you Okay. And I hear this, yeah. <laughs> and they retreated from the three of us. But Willow took out Wolf the Mighty, damn near killed him. <laughs> I remember Willow coming back from a Penzik early on before I could 
afford to go to Benzer. And this is back when people who didn't want to fight women had to, they wore insignia that indicated they wouldn't fight women. Okay, wait, there was a specific insignia to show that you would not fight women? What did it look like? Was it yellow? <laughs> <laughs> well, it should have been. I don't honestly remember because I never saw one. Okay. But uh, Willow, Willow goes to Penzik and I don't remember how, but they wound up pairing her with this knight out of the Middle Kingdom who was one of the people who wouldn't fight women. Okay. Now, Willow fought Spear, mm -hmm. and she fought in a dress, mm -hmm. an ankle-length dress, Okay. which, as she pointed out, was better crotch armor than anything anybody had ever developed. And they wandered off into the war, and this guy ran with Willow all day long, and at the end of the day, he came out going, this was awesome! I would run up to people and she would stab them. It was great. <laughs> um, which in a lot of ways kind of describes Willow, if you think about it, you know. Um, yeah, wow. I haven't even thought about that story in years. Um, but yeah, um, oh, okay. I got a, I got another on story at war story that is kind of about Willow and, and Sif Ironhand of all people. Okay. Um, now, again, remember I mentioned earlier that we were outnumbered about four to one, maybe five to one in the onshore Kalantir War. Mm -hmm. So Lloyd, being the canny tactician that he was, decided that he would have his personal bodyguard of two people and everybody else would fill in the flanks. His bodyguards were Sif Ironhand, a, I'm going to go with like, she was 18 at this point. And I think she just bullied Lloyd into becoming his squire mm -hmm. and Willow. And Lloyd says, y'all just follow me and kill anybody that comes in at my back. And we call the on and we're standing there looking at seriously outnumbered troops and they aren't coming to us. So we charge, of course, because, you know, on And um, Lloyd hits their front line and blows a hole in it and is cutting his way to the back. And, and he, you know, he lost Willow and Sif behind him. And Willow tells me later that it was really weird because these people would look at her and they'd turn around to go fight Lloyd and then she'd stab them. <laughs> you know, because she was just this fat duchess, right? You know, she wasn't a threat. The funniest yeah, part of that whole story is that after the first charge, there were three Onstorans left. And they, the swirl of the battle was such that they wound up on this little hillock in this mud bath that we were fighting in. And the two guys looked at Sif because she was a squire. And they said, what do we do now? And she said, we're Onstorans, we charge. <laughs> and they did. Um, <laughs> There's a Lord Jonathan story. They went up to a small event in Oklahoma that was basically 24 new fighters and John and Willow and John and, and Lloyd on the field. And they're trying to do melees. And so the only reasonable way to do it is to have John and 12 versus Lloyd and 12. And every single time it just got down to John versus Lloyd. And finally they said, okay, we're going to do something different. Lloyd and John challenge the 24. Oh, my. They won. So they're standing there. They're, it's about Carl Leon. And I don't know who said it, but who said which. But one of Lloyd and Jonathan said, what are we going to do? And the other one said, we'll surround them. That was Lloyd. So they <laughs> did. They each went in a different opposite direction, went all the way around the line, kept going around the line until you have this mass of 24 people who have no idea what to do, snuggled up against each other so they cannot move. And then Lloyd and John would just throw in the occasional blow into this little egg of non-functioning fighter <laughs> until it went down to nobody. Yeah, so that was John good and, and Jonathan and Lloyd surrounded two dozen fighters and one. Tanakh, if that isn't story worthy, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, the first time I ever are, met Horace Natterhelm. All these are pretty amazing, to be honest. I, I'm, 
Yeah, I gotta say it's it's very interesting because you know I I'm I'm new to the SCA. I have only been playing for two years, at this point. Um, I don't know most of these people personally, um, but you know I still feel the very effects of their actions. You know, if it wasn't for uh, John and Willow, I would not be Premier Bard today. Like, or we would not be here today. You know, the things that they do and they did direct and influence the future of us and, and it's it's fascinating because for me it's it's almost it's almost how bardic tradition would have been intended me gathering here and hearing from those who were before me and hearing about those who came before me um it's fascinating to actually be able to experience that that living history part of the sca uh firsthand you know Oh, I can only hope that I will remember these stories. And thankfully, we have better record keeping than just word of mouth <laughs> these days. <laughs> so, you know, thankfully. And we we'll got this really great historian that, you know, doesn't really do much. <laughs> just th just works her fingers to the bone daily. Right. You're talking about the woman who bullies me into telling stories? Yeah, I same one. I am, I am yeah. such a meanie. I am such a meanie. The, the woman who, who invites yeah. others and then gently guides the conversation forcefully with direct questions? That's the one. Something along those lines, yeah. Ever, ever so gently. Yes, terribly, terribly gently. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome His Grace Miguel. It's has... Miguel. Hey. All right. Look at that. Grace. But uh, yeah, it's it's wonderful to actually you know hear these things. I I came to pay my respects because you know of the office I hold. I I owe a lot to to John to his grace. But it's still like I said, it's still amazing to and it's very humbling to be so new to the SCA and to get to kind of hear where where our heritage comes from, on Stero wise. I mean, uh, it's it's fascinating. Well, I don't think anybody uh, pushed, forced, beat on us Bardic more than John and Willow. Uh, th they wanted, if you were a knight, you should also be a bard. Yeah. You should be able to entertain. You, sh you should have something, a story, a song, a poem, something. Don't just be a knuckle drag. They, they beat that into our heads for years. I mean, it, it, you know, they didn't have to beat it into mine. I was a drama major in college. But I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to participate in, in the activities that uh, they provided. And uh, I, I think that our solid Bardic traditions came to a for a, to a very great extent from them. I would agree with that. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it's interesting. You look at the early reigns of Anciora and, <clears throat> you know, our third king is here. Um, although he's being really <laughs> quiet, which is weird. For, not really. Yes, very weird. Yeah, yeah. If uh, I could throw in a couple of uh, rather early reminiscences of uh, Jonathan, uh, going back to the uh, unreinforced Freon helmet days, uh, the first time I ever saw Jonathan, well, first time I ever really saw him, he wasn't associated with Willow at the time. It was just... Uh, he was uh, training with Chorus, was what people tend to tell you about him. And uh, I was uh, sitting, it was at Camp Burnett with uh, Sir DeVeith Lord Silvertongue. Did you know him, Corwin? Anyway, uh, he oh, died. I knew him. Yeah, I knew him. The man who you never wanted to take his leg. And uh, he was, uh, he called himself the errant knight of Ottenveld. And he'd make sure you understood that's not knight errant, it's the errant knight. And I still have a couple of, uh, when I, I was a newcomer, he was the first knight I ever met. And uh, 
I purchased a couple of wall hanger type swords just to use as costuming adjuncts. You know, I made scabbards <laughs> and belts and things for them. But uh, I was sitting with him and Jonathan entered the list field. And I went, you know, that guy's wearing your armor. And he says, oh, I sold it to him. And uh, this was, uh, well, it was, he used it for a long time. It was uh, strips of leather making a corslet. And then he had these big, I think they were sheepskin, but they were partially dyed. And for the world, they look like collies. But they gave real fair uh, protection to the collarbone area. And uh, he was using the long-handled mace, you know, that he became noted for, and uh, the big scutum-type shield that became a hallmark of the northern part of the kingdom later. Uh, he really had a huge impact on, on how things were done. I think Stargate people resented him, but... Uh, uh, you know, when Stargate kind of typified the South, I mean, Border March was still uh, a new group getting started out there. Um, but uh, somebody else was with us or walked up as Devith and I were, were sitting there watching the bout and, and they, they looked at Jonathan and said, what's that oaf doing in the tournament? <laughs> and uh, if you'd ever seen young Jonathan fight, he was tall and rather gangly. And he would uh, take his time to wind up a blow. And uh, the big thing he always said, once he got that mace in motion, he didn't stop it. And he could hit you from any angle. It doesn't have an edge that you've got to be uh, respectful of. And, uh, you know, he just was going in his uh, not exactly rhythmic because he would break rhythm on it, but uh, he was carefully covered. I know the times I fought him, I always, uh, he'd always tempt me into trying to break the rhythm because he was borderline exposed at several points. And usually I wind up exposing myself, trying to take advantage of that potential opening there. He uh, looked clumsy, especially when he started, but he had very good control of himself. And yeah, uh, I think it was Devith's response to the guy of what's that oaf doing on the field? And Devith said, he's going to win the tournament. And uh, he was Jonathan Nobody at this time. But, you know, I mean, people with any, any sense could see that the man uh, was very centered in spirit and, and could fight. And he was very intelligent. Uh, when he spoke, he spoke with a huge self-assurance. He'd just say, this is how it is. Uh, I think it was last year, I, I was uh, just uh, sitting with him drinking a little bit, you know, and, and uh, I told him, well, the doctors aren't letting me fight now, but I'm doing archery, you know, and I'm saying I'm winning a few things, but it doesn't mean much because, you know, and, and, and he was with a typical Jonathan, you know, uh, yes, winning something does mean something, you know, it, it says something about the skill and things. And he did have that respect for winning much more so than I did. And it was a thing that, that I could learn from him. And uh, obviously, being as it was just a year or two ago, uh, it wasn't uh, something that I learned well. I, I tend to treat the SCA as playfully, much more so than many strong competitors. Uh, 
And I, I think, you know, my, my one loss record, whatever else suffers for it, granted. But uh, Jonathan, I played chess with him. And he was a very intelligent and analytical man. I mean, most SCA chess players uh, are dabblers. And uh, if you played some serious chess with him, he, he'd respond to it well. He, uh, he'd never try to quote from books what he was doing. He just played. And he was a very skilled opponent. And, and more than that, uh, you could tell from his play, it was much like his uh, demeanor on the field. I'd just like to, if I people put up with me going into one more digression, it was when Chorus was king of Ottenville the first time, and uh, he was at a Bjornsborg event. And uh, this was at the time where Grey Raven was being a real turd, first baron of Bjornsborg. And uh, we had a royal court, which was short and sweet. And then uh, Grey Raven was going to do his court. And it was a cold night. And we had a, uh, well, it, it looked like a, a Roman style tent, kind of like a small house, you know, with four sides and eaves and things. And we could go in there and get out of the wind anyway, because uh, we knew for sure we were not welcome. <laughs> Great Raven's Court. And, uh, you know, we, we were just sitting in there and drinking and talking and, you know, taking turns entertaining each other. And Willow comes up and sticks her head in the tent and just smiles and says, the Baron's here. And we went, oh boy, what now? You know, and uh, you know, she opens up and holds aside the tent flaps and in steps Jonathan. Because at court, Chorus had decreed that for the next 24 hours, Jonathan Delaufison was the Baron of Bjornsborg. And uh, he decided to come in and was holding court and let everybody know that he was going to. And he had a very impish sense of humor. There are a lot of people who, when given the role of king of misrule or, uh, you know, similar things are uh, very heavy handed in the sort of humor they do, you know, ordering people about whatever. And uh, I cannot, for the life of me, it was a long time ago, think of a good for instance. But Jonathan was very witty, you know, and he wound up taking us as his entourage as the Baron of Bjorn's ward. <laughs> and uh, he went about to the campfires, as was commonly done in those days. And uh, Anyway, these are some very early reminiscences of seeing Jonathan for the, you know, the first few times. And one aside, people commenting on Willow fighting with Spear, I believe that the first time she ever fought with Spear was at the first Barbarian tournament. Uh, she came down there and she had a Freon can helmet and a kidney belt and a spear. And we were just doing, you know, this was barbarian, no formal lists and things, just, uh, you know, setting up melees and stuff. And uh, Randall von Nordlichwald had a melee team. And uh, I, I was Jan Nobody at the time, but I had the other melee team. And Willow was going to be on my team. And she just went, well, you know, you got to tell me what to do. And I said, okay, Randall has his big shield. Do you see the lower right-hand corner, his left? Okay, I'm going to go up there and he's going to look at me. And I want you to walk up and just take your spear with both hands and hit that bottom corner just as hard as you can. 
And uh, she, you know, looked focused and went, okay. Uh, now, you know, Willow's very bombastic and stuff, but she was very, uh, you know, I'm learning something new. I'll do what you tell me. And I went up there and I was looking menacing and kind of sidling to his sword side on, on Randall. And she walked up and pasted the corner of his shield. And his shield went spoing, just nailed him right down the middle. She did just exactly what she was asked to do. And it worked the first time. And I hope that helped encourage her later on. But that, that, that is, uh, you know, it's not that she went up and cleaned house on the field, but she did just what she was told and it worked. Yeah, she loved to fight Spear. Oh, yeah. Every time we'd uh, be at a, a war melee situation, uh, Willow would always find me. She liked to uh, run with me. Uh, if I'm carrying sword and shield, she'd run with me as my spearman. And uh, we had a great time, the two of us. Uh, I'd hook, go up and hook a shield, and she'd stick them, or she'd punch the corner of the shield and open it up for me. Pow, we, we racked up some kills, she and I. And I, I enjoyed doing that with her, and she had the greatest time. Uh, but, uh, I mean... <laughs> Willow was one of a kind. Is it still is, but uh, yeah. she she was one of a kind and a damn fine lady. Your Grace Miguel, do you have any stories about His Grace Jonathan that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I, I mean, I just echoing what you know, Inman and and the other guys are saying. It, it um, I've been having some technical difficulties with my headset and switch around. So uh, I'd, I'd go back on, oh, first of all, she loved fighting spear. And I think I had heard that, that uh, story that Don was telling a number of times from her. She loved that one. She loved running with Inman and she was always super humble about, about that. So yeah, that was, um, but it, it made her day to be able to go out there and, and run and gun with uh, Inman and the guys. Uh, but as far as what Inman was saying about uh, John and, and Willow 2 being really astounding players in, in on store from the standpoint of the Bardic uh, community. I mean, they, they, they encouraged me to get out there and do uh, Bard craft. And they, uh, they, the entire gypsy camp, if you guys remember that, uh, was was you know their their big show. They made me king of the gypsies, but it was all you know John and Willow was doing. They just kind of put me up like a, a a puppet and said go do it. And then they just orchestrated this whole thing around me being king of the gypsies. But it it was it was all for the spectacle of being able to do it. So it was it was all for everybody else, and they just wanted everybody to have a good time. And uh, to to what Inman was saying, it's like they. They loved getting people involved with all of the different arts. I mean, that they, they, besides just the, the Bardic that he was mentioning, uh, they'd get painting projects going on. A lot of the banners that you saw around the kingdom, uh, you know, Willow had done a lot of them. I mean, there were other people that did them as well, of course, but but Willow certainly decorated a lot of halls with, with her own uh, 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 art. And John was always in there recruiting people to help her do it and that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's 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 a lot of stories. I I'll tell you a quick little funny one. The first time I ever fought John, uh, I was a I was a swishy poke at the time, and I thought I'd I'd take up heavy because you know it looked easy, right? <laughs> No, I, I thought I, I was I was having a good time with light, but I thought, well, you know, heavy, heavy looks challenging in a different kind of way. And I went over to an LC practice, I don't know, it was like 25 years ago or something like that. And uh, uh, it was a challenge tourney, and I was the the lowest ranked guy on the in the list, right? And so I ch I challenged the top guy, which was Duke John, and it was a a, a single sword tournament. 
well, I had shown up late to, to, to the rapier practice over there. So I, I didn't have a whole lot of gear on me and they had slogged all this heavy armor on me and put me in a helm and that kind of thing. And I'm standing out there right before about to fight John. And it's like, I don't have a cup on. <laughs> and it was like, ah, uh, that's all right. You know, it's, it's probably not going to last very long. It hit me in the head. That'll be the end of it. And then and I'll go and I'll go over there and, and see if I can, I can find something. Well, You'll find this amusing, uh, uh, Your Grace. John took a horse stance with his sword down low. And as soon as they said lay on, he brought that thing up and across, right across my crotch. And I was pretty quick in the day. So I, as I saw a move, I smitched back a bit. And it just grazed right by that whole business down there. <laughs> and that, that was his first shot. And it, and it, it missed. But I stepped out and I yielded the bow and said, well done, Your Grace. And I walked off the field. <laughs> it's like, that was the last, the first and only time that I have fought, and, uh, fought without a, a cup. And that was the first, and the first time I'd fought John. So, uh, yeah, you, you got to, the, the lesson learned is always wear protection and, and be careful what you do when you're fighting dukes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's a fantastic story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It could have been a lot worse of a story. <laughs> so I remember once, uh, John Squires all got pissed off because his helmet looked like a raisin. Uh, a big pardon. Jonathan <laughs> wore for years this uh, Korean ear. Korean War era army pot helm that they made. You basically cut the brim off, you welded a, a <laughs> cylinder onto it. <laughs> and that helmet had been hit so many times, it looked like a raisin. <laughs> oh. And it was it's, close it's fit, so it, it was terrible. Oh, it was. It was it was the <laughs> ugliest helmet I have ever seen. <laughs> He wore I mean, that you know, and he was a duke, by the way. I should point this out. He was a duke at this point. <clears throat> and his squires got together and said, we can't do this. We can't have our knight running around wearing this helmet. It's just embarrassing. So they all got together and they got him a new helmet. And it was one he could actually wear his glasses in. And we're at a fighter practice in Namron. And he pulls out the new helmet. I'm like, oh, hey, that's really cool. He says, yeah, the squires got it for me. They don't like my old helmet. Oh, okay. He puts it on, puts his glasses on, he puts his helmet on. He's like, oh, this is really interesting. You know, he walks out and two minutes later, I swear to God, two minutes later, he comes walking back, rips the helmet off, throws it back in his bag, pulls his old one out, puts it on. I said, what, doesn't work? And he said, no, no, I can see what they're doing. It's scaring the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> It's absolutely true. I was there. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Learning to fight against a guy who won't fall for face. Because <laughs> um, you can't see him. Yeah, that was, oh, God, yeah. I remember that. I remember the story. Um, does anybody here besides Robin and, and Inman? And yeah, I guess, yeah, no, okay, there's three. Uh, Y'all remember when Sif was learning to fight? Oh, yeah. yeah. When she was on the, I'm going to go everywhere and fight everybody kick that she was on. So Sif Ironhan, when she was squired to Lloyd, when she got into college, she would get about a week ahead of her college work. And then she would throw her kit in the car and she'd drive to a barony and make all the chivalry fight her. Well, make is probably too strong a word. but And um, she was in the steps one day and she was practicing with, with Lloyd and Jonathan. And... Um, they had both, you know, been very kind and been working with her on her technique and stuff. And she made the mistake of saying, I've never seen you guys fight. And they said, okay. <laughs> so they went after each other the way Lloyd and John used to go after each other. And I think Jan has seen that. I think Inman's seen that. I'm not sure that anybody else ever saw it. I have. Let's just say it was like, don't actually have a good piranha <laughs> ripping a leg of mine. 
And they beat on each other for a few minutes and then they stopped and Sif is just sitting there and her eyes had done this, right? And she's like, you guys never fight me that way. And they looked at her and said, yeah, well, it wouldn't be any good, would it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a John story. But... <laughs> I love oh, standing next to Jonathan when watching something because he would always pick up a pick up on something subtle that everyone missed. I remember once there was this hot new young squire everyone was excited by, young Mahadi. And everyone was talking about how fast his sword was. And I'm standing next to Jonathan while we're watching Mahdi fight. The person on his other side said, wow, he's fast. And Jonathan said, no, he's not, he's slow. And the guy said, did you see how fast his sword moved? And Jonathan, you said, yes. I saw his sword move. <laughs> the fast guys, I can't see the sword move. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It just, oh, yeah. it is so obvious once he points it out, but no one else is going to notice that. Yeah, he had great perception. It's one of the best set of eyes I've ever seen. Well, he taught me how to hide my hand until I hit people. <laughs> I was talking with Inman about this the other day. John had the oddest shot angles that you you think you were completely protected. And, you know, as people have commented before, so it's not news. He wasn't the fastest guy around. And, uh, and so I'd get up there and I, I was pretty quick in the day and I get up there and I block these shots and he hit me anyway. I was like, how did, how did he manage to do that? I, I still don't know. I think it was certain angles of his elbow and wrist and that kind of thing in combination that managed, allowed him to slide things in that, that didn't seem open to begin with. So, Well, he could put a, an inch and a quarter stick in an inch and a quarter hole. Yeah. Every uh, time. No question about it. Yeah, and you gotta you gotta remember how many hours of practice it took for him to put that inch and a quarter sword yeah. in an inch and a quarter hole. Yeah, it, you know, it, it didn't just you know he didn't spring full grown you know from Thor's head. He worked. You know, oh yeah, he had a work ethic, and and that was something that that not too many people saw, and and you don't really see that with a lot of fighters because they, this is things they do at home on a pill or practicing with their students. Uh, but his work ethic was, you know, absolutely uh, extraordinary. Most well, when he fighters was practice until they can do it right. Jonathan practiced until he couldn't do it long. That's right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It, because it was m muscle memory, he could throw the blow and not think about the blow, and he knew where it was going. And that's uh, that's work ethic. That's uh, the only way to get that is just re repetition. Uh, when, he, when he was Chorus's squire, um, Chorus figured out he was uh, working at the time as a night auditor in a Ramada Inn. And Chorus figured out that the way his schedule worked at two o'clock in the morning. He was a dead spot. So Chorus literally showed up at the hotel at two o'clock in the morning and they would go out in the back in the yard in the parking lot and practice. <laughs> yeah. At two o'clock in the morning. Oh yeah, he told me that story. Yeah. Chorus told me that story, so I believe. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, you Jonathan, know, Jonathan told me that about that because he and I have about the same kind of work ethic. Yeah. And, and that was one of the things that, I, you know, I, I think bonded us as, as teachers was the fact that, that, yeah, if we were willing to work that hard and we could get our students to work that hard, our students who had uh, uh, gifts in particular would, would really come on. And Mahadi was one of those. Uh, and, yeah, he, he was – Slow to Jonathan, but he was fast to everyone else, as, uh, as we all know. <laughs> well, Thank you, everyone, for uh, your words. I unfortunately need to be get going, um, but it, it was a pleasure to hear from everyone. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, kind of understanding the lineage of where I come from now in my position, it's it's um, it's humbling and it's, it's a little overwhelming, you know, to 
to uh, feel that spirit, no matter how far we are. Yeah. Tannock, remember this. We, we've been telling you about his stories, but you have on, you're listening to this. So I'm going to tell you about one of his stories. He wrote a song that I think half the people who listened to it never understood because it was a song about giving three roses to his lady. First, he gave her a blue rose, then he gave her a yellow rose, and then he gave her another yellow rose. And I have no earthly idea how many of his, um, the people listening to it, knew he was talking about making a queen of Aitenvelt once and then making a queen of Onstero twice. Thank you for sharing that secret with me. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to commit that one to bardic memory. <laughs> Thank you Thank so much you. for your words. Thank you. Remember for this if you remember nothing else of them. I will. They sacrificed themselves to see the star rise ascendant, ascendant over the sun of Aiden. Amen. I absolutely will. Thank you. I mean, I, I said this at 40 years. <laughs> These are the people who delivered the kingdom from the tyranny of Aiden. <laughs> <laughs> get out there and he talked about a particular shot and the mechanics of it and that kind of thing and then work through it. So it was, it was a really different flavor, the two practices. Well, John would work uh, very well on, uh, on the basics, uh, you know, and uh, how, how to throw the blows. So we threw them the same way. So it didn't make any difference, but, and then he would send you guys to me to work on, on on approach and attitude and footwork. Footwork, yeah. Uh, and and footwork. Uh, <clears throat> when when I got most of you guys, y'all had crap for footwork. Yeah, John didn't focus much on footwork. He really didn't. Well, that's because his was so lousy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he but he made that lousy part of how he did it. <laughs> You know, it, it, you, you can't. Uh, I wouldn't have even began to have tried to get him to change. But. <laughs> You guys, I could work with. Uh, he, yeah, that he 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 has loved you guys, everybody. You know, get out there, go to Inman's house. You know, learn to learn footwork, then then take what you've learned here, put it all together. Uh, that was what we tried to do together: was try to put what we taught you guys into you to make a complete package, so you could be successful. Yeah. And at, for somebody at his level of teaching, he was so open for sending us outside to get other stuff, you know. And I think he that you know he knew that he was he had specialty areas, you know, his his shot mechanics and uh, slides and stuff like that. And then you know for you know if he didn't know footwork or didn't know a particular weapon type or whatever, he would send us elsewhere, you know. Yes, of course we you know. We, you have to go get the best for your students. Um, if, I, if I couldn't do it, he could do it. If he couldn't do it, I could do it. Or we'd send you to somebody else that could do it. You know, go talk to, go work with uh, somebody else with, for spear or, or work with somebody else for a two-handed sword. Um, but, uh, and, and we were hard on you guys. We knew it. <laughs> yes. And yes, we you were. There, there was no... <laughs> There was no punches pulled from either one of us. We were hard on you because if you got it, you earned it. And once you've earned something, you get it. You get this special feeling. I earned this. I know how to do this. I can succeed with this. I paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. I paid heavily for this, so I'm going <laughs> to use it. And, and that's important. That was, uh, you know, our way of helping you <laughs> as much as it yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's one where area where rapier definitely ha is up on uh, on heavy. <laughs> is that you know I could always walk after <laughs> rapier practice. <laughs> you remember the, you remember the time we were out in your backyard. And you hit me so hard in the shield that I called it and uh, as a leg shot. <laughs> and I was like, good, your grace. And he's like, 
Miguel, I didn't hit you. I said, oh, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I don't remember that, but I'll take it. Uh, <clears throat> we had we had such a, a variety of people between the two of us that, uh, you know, it, it, teaching you guys, working with you was just, you know, entertaining beyond anything I can tell you. I used to go, I'd go in and Athena would uh, get, uh, you know, how are they doing? You know, and they, she'd go, she knew who everybody was at practice and she'd always ask, she'd never come out, but she'd always ask, well, how's Miguel doing? You know, how's Gunther doing? And how's uh, um, Mahadi doing? And always that way. And, and we had always had uh, a few uh, I, I can think of one, Eric the Carver. You remember him? Yeah. Oh Eric, yeah. Yeah. He tried. He tried so hard. And he came out and worked so hard. You know, we knew he was probably never going to get it. You know, uh, because he was uh, he wasn't really committed to it, but he just wanted to learn. So he, he he's one of the few we actually took it easy on. Yeah. Well, I I remember how motivated Lance was to getting better. And uh, yeah. oh my gosh, you would you would beat him until like he couldn't stand. And I I remember the only time I remember you going out on the field and say, no, you're done was with Lance because he, he just you just beaten and beaten and beaten him and he just didn't want to give up. And it was like just it wasn't a, it was it was not fun to watch. It was that bad. And uh, you sent you made him go sit down. I don't know if that's the night that you hit him down the back and lit him up like. A, remember you kind of you zapped it down his spine and he just popped right up and then fell straight forward like a board. Well, <laughs> let me let me tell you the story of Lance and you all might get a kick out of it. Lance and I went fishing. Uh, my little boat. We went out to Lake Ray Hubbard. <clears throat> launched the boat. We were headed out to a fishing hole and he was bugging me. You need to squire me. You need to squire me. I, I, I'm not. I'm not taking any more squires. I don't want any more squires. I don't know. And he kept on and kept on and kept on until I finally said, oh, shit, okay. All right, I'll squire you. And uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Well, his whole idea was he'd just come fight with me and get better by osmosis. <laughs> and everything I told, told him to do or tried to teach him to do, he wouldn't do. He kept doing it his way over and over again. <clears throat> Until I, I'd almost given up. And, and I had to figure out now how am I going to get him to want to learn so one one Saturday afternoon he and I were fighting at my house and I <clears throat> knew he was very vulnerable to the offside so I kept hitting him in the uh, in the right hip with, with you know this old snapshot you cross body bam I hit him in the right hip and I did it over and over and over and over until he dropped to his knees and cried. <laughs> and my, my Athena had been watching. She came out and she started giving me holy hell for abusing Lance until he came up with tears rolling down his face, said, I, I don't know how to fight. Teach me. Oh, uh -huh. And from that point on, when I told him to do something, he did it. When I showed him a move, he'd do it. Before that, nothing. He wouldn't. And he still tells a story about I, how I broke him like a colt. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. And, and then he'd, uh, but he learned, and eventually he was knighted. Hey. I have a question about a story that John used to tell me, um, and it was the and it was, it was before my time, so I, I didn't know if any of you guys would have been there. But it was some kind of a, a melee where it ended up with just with I think it was a John and Lloyd 
against a whole bunch of people and the <laughs> line came out, Oh my God, we're surrounded by Lloyd or something like that. Do you guys, were you, any of you there? Do you remember yeah, that? Corwin told that story earlier where he and he and John went out and ran around them in circles and, and packed them into a little pack and then beat all of them. It's like 20 something of them. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good time for them. We, we got, uh, well, we got a lot of good memories, you know. Yeah. We seem to be running out of Jonathan's stories, and tomorrow is Monday, so y'all have fun. I'm going to have to leave. Yeah, I think yeah. we went a little past time here, too. Yeah. I think it's after nine. We did, but that's Thank well, you, it's great hearing from y'all, y'all, you know. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I appreciate you sharing your stories. I am going to be posting this to the Historian's YouTube channel, and hopefully others will enjoy these stories as much as I have. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for having us. Thanks for hosting. And on a small, quiet note, Your Grace Inman, if you got Your Grace Miguel involved with heavy combat, I owe you a thank you because I received my award of arms from Miguel and Connell in their first reign <laughs> and was incredibly embarrassed because I'd never been to a royal court before and I had no idea what to do. I just knew that I had to curtsy before the crown, but nobody ever told me when I was allowed to stand up. So there was a photograph of me trying <laughs> desperately to keep kneeling while Miguel <laughs> is trying to raise me up and present the newest lady of Onsteora and I wouldn't <laughs> off my knees. <laughs> Because I was so embarrassed and didn't know what to do. So thank you for your patience and eventually getting me up off my knees and sending me that's, on my way. Oh, that's a lovely story. <laughs> that's great. Well, thanks for ending on a high note. Absolutely. Thank you so much all for being here. Bye, everyone. Good, Good night, night, buddy. Bye, bud.